Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh session of the PWL International Seminar. As you know, this seminar is hosted by IFILNOVA in the context of the FCT funded project Mapping Philosophy as a Way of Life, and it takes place once a month in this virtual format. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Caleb Coho, and we are very happy to have him here. I will now just shortly introduce him. Professor Caleb Coho is professor and chair of the Department of Philosophy at the Metropolitan State University of Denver. He received his doctorate in 2012 from Princeton University's program in classical philosophy. And since then, he has published many articles on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, medieval philosophy, and philosophy of religion in journals, including Apeiron, British Journal for the History of Philosophy, Oxford Studies in Philosophy of Religion, Philosophical, Philosophical Quarterly, and Phronesis. Professor Coho is the editor of Aristotle's On the Soul, a critical guide published by Cambridge University Press in 2022. He has served as one of the lead faculty advisors for the Philosophy as a Way of Life project, co-authored two articles with Stephen Grimm on living philosophically, and defended Augustine's other otherworldly approach to happiness in an Oxford Studies in Medieval Philosophy article. Coho has ongoing projects on Aristotle's theory of understanding and Augustine's views on philosophical and religious ways of life. And today he's going to bring Augustine to our seminar and give a talk with the title Augustine's on the Trinity as Protheticus and Spiritual Exercise, the Christian Pursuit of Inner Wisdom. So thank you, Caleb, for being here. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for this invitation. And uh, I'm excited to see how this um, project develops. So what I'm going to be doing today is um, looking at Augustine's thought and where he fits into philosophy as a way of life. Um, partly as a test case for um, how religious and philosophical ways of life um, fit or are, are, are different or not. Um, so I'm going to give some context on some of the scholarly and interpretive debate um, about Augustine, and then um, we'll look at the, the difference between um, Augustine's uh, early views and um, then the the views that he he develops and what what the pursuit of wisdom looks like um, in his his later thought. Um, okay, can everyone see the slideshow? All right. Yes. Okay. So some context. Um, so obviously, Augustine is writing uh, near the end of the Western Roman Empire um, in a context where Platonist philosophy uh, is still going strong, um, but not too far before the end of some of the ancient philosophical schools and before um, Christian and to a lesser extent Jew Jewish and and and. Um, then Muslim theology in the East will take over. Um, and some people, including uh, uh, one of the people I wrote my dissertation under, John Cooper, um, see Augustine as kind of ending the, tr the ancient tradition of um, philosophy as a way of life by um, giving up on a life based purely on philosophical <laughs> thought and understanding in favor of um, pursuing this kind of personal relationship with god that's no longer philosophical or rational in the, in in the same way and no longer focused on living and acting well um but on the other hand uh scholars of augustine like peter brown have really emphasized the the central role that wisdom plays for augustine and and the way that that's continuous with um ancient conceptions of wisdom um and I think it's it's quite clear and that the early Augustine is continuing this tradition, um, but it gets a little more complicated, as we'll see in, in the on the Trinity that we'll be, we'll be looking at in a minute. But first, I want to give a little context for those who might not 
be as familiar with um, Augustine's initial approach to, to wisdom as thought. So one of the central events of his life is this encounter he has when he's 17 and reads Cicero's Hortensius, um, this work now lost that Taylor, exhorts. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt you. You're, several people on the chat are asking for you to put uh, the slides on uh, in, in full screen mode because we are seeing both the slides and the notes. I don't know if oh, you can. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sorry. Um, just fix that. Yeah, we're seeing it fine now. It's the uh, full screen okay. mode. Thank you. That's better. Okay, great. Okay, so Augustine, when he's 17, reads this work that's an exhortation towards wisdom and philosophy um, of Cicero's that's that's no longer extant and is based on um, Aristotle's Protrepticus. Um, uh, another work that we no long, longer, uh, well, that we only have, have fragments of, um, but made the case that uh, the philosophical way of life, the way of life devoted to wisdom um, is the best. And that's what Augustine really takes from that, um, as he puts it, that to love and seek and pursue and hold and embrace with all my strength, not one sect or another, but wisdom itself, wherever it was to be found. I was roused by Cicero's words, kindled and ablaze. In Augustine's account, he gets a little distracted by um, the pursuit of uh, status and rhetoric and his involvement with, with the Manichees. But he continues to think that, um, as he says in this dedication to one of his earliest works, that no life can be a happy one except insofar as it's lived in philosophy. Um, and if we look at uh, how he understands wisdom in this um, early work, Contra Academicos, um, against uh, the, the, the skeptical academy, um, he describes wisdom as the right way of life. He takes over this definition of wisdom from Cicero as a knowledge of divine and of human things. Um, and what he means by knowledge of human things is uh, the virtues, the, the cardinal virtues that are um, mentioned in Plato, then defined and used by the Stoics and Cicero, um, where you've got practical wisdom, moderation, courage, and justice. So, so far, we have a fairly standard um, ancient philosophical view um, that Augustine's holding, where he's blending Stoic and Platonic elements, um, but is clearly continuing this um, wisdom tradition and is seeing um, the best life as the life of reason. Um, again, he's following Cicero, influenced by, by Aristotle, that the highest part of us is the reason or mind and so it's in fulfilling that that we we live well. Um, and he also holds out hope of achieving wisdom. You see on the third quote of this slide, not that he's achieved it yet, but that it is achievable with continued investigation, or at least, um, and this is the question they look at in the Contra Academicos, perhaps the pursuit of wisdom itself can make for the happy life, even if you haven't yet achieved it. That's, um, that's the central open question of, of that, that dialogue. Um, but in his later works, um, where we see Augustine, the bishop and theologian, um, we get uh, a more suspicious attitude towards the philosophers and also some reconsiderations of his earlier views. So um, in this work where he explicitly goes through his, his writings and says, says how his views have changed, the Retractionis, um, he notes that he has an issue 
with what he himself had said in these early works that um, suggesting that uh, you can achieve, the wise person can achieve happiness um, regardless of the condition of his body. And he says, well, first, we don't have the perfect knowledge of God that would be needed for happiness and the state of our body also matters. Um, and in um, this sermon, he attacks this idea of the Stoics that he'd earlier been sympathetic to, that um, happiness can consist in the enjoyment of the virtue of one soul that um, the sage has for the Stoics. Um, and then more generally attacks um, this idea in his famous attack on the philosophers in Book 19 of the City of God that uh, we can uh, achieve the ultimate good in this life through um, the development of either the soul or the body. Um, whereas Augustine says the best kind of virtue humans can achieve in this life is just uh, fighting against um, vices and evils. And um, as long as we're not safe, as long as we're still in this weakened condition, um, fighting against evil, then we can't be said to be enjoying our our final happiness because it's it's still a struggle and we don't have the truly good virtues um and we see this critique in the work i'll be focusing on on, on the trinity um where again he takes um from cicero this idea that happiness consists um <clears throat> in living as you will and willing nothing wrongly and then augustine claims the philosophers, even the Stoics who claim to have achieved this, um, can't. They've, they're, they, they, they say that they have everything they will, but they've only achieved that by um, being fine with their lives being ended or destroyed. Um, but Augustine says, who is there who would not will any kind of life that he enjoyed and thus called happy to be so in his power that he could have it last perpetually? And yet who is in such a position? Does anyone will to suffer troubles he would endure bravely, even though he wills to and can endure them if he suffers them? So Augustine thinks there's a kind of excellence in endurance, um, but those really are troubles that you're enduring. And the idea that, that um, as the Stoics think, that you could will to end your life and consent to that, um, Augustine thinks is, is just crazy. If it's, it really is the good and happy life, then uh, you, you have to um, will for it to go on. That's, that's just part of what the desire for, for happiness means. Um, and if you don't will for your life to go on, well, then that's a sign your life really isn't the happy one. So this, the fact that um, we haven't, philosophers haven't overcome death, but instead have just tried to um, be all right with death is a sign that they they haven't really achieved the happiness they, they, they claim to achieve. Um, but in this context where Augustine is suspicious of whether these virtues can be achieved and suggests um, we, we can't um, maybe achieve happiness or wisdom, um, and instead we need faith, you might wonder whether he has really um, switched projects here um, and is really no longer operating within this um, ancient philosophical tradition of pursuing wisdom and seeing wisdom as the best way of life. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is um, make the case that uh, even though some things have significantly changed, um, even in this, this late work on the Trinity, we really see Augustine still giving a version of uh, Protrapticus, of a, an exhortation to wisdom and picking up and developing uh, common themes um, in that were already there in Cicero, 
that Augustine was familiar with and that also show up in the, the Platonists and, and Aristotle that he's um, to some extent directly familiar with and, and, and also getting through Cicero, that we still see um, Augustine advocating for the superiority of contemplative, contemplative wisdom over practical choice and over useful activities. Um, and that like Cicero and Aristotle, he's going to insist on a union between practical and contemplative knowledge and virtue. Um, and this idea that by living a more divine life, we actually live a more fully human one. And that um, we connect to the divine through developing our own minds. Um, and we still have the same goal as um, of, of wisdom and wisdom is still the same way to happiness. So those are all the aspects in which I'm going to argue he he um, his thought is continuous with his earlier tradition. But um, that's not to say there aren't significant differences. So um, now instead of attaining wisdom on our own, um, there's this crucial idea of Jesus Christ, the incarnate word as the mediator um, that's going to allow for both um, knowledge uh, about temporal things and how to act well through um, his the example of his life um, and is going to be the path towards wisdom. Um, and that's something he thinks we can progress towards um, but can't achieve um, unlike some, someone like um, Aristotle, but there is still meaningful progress, Augustine wants to say, and that differentiates his his um, picture from that of the Stoics, where either you're wise or you're not. Um, but this progress is dependent um, more so on on God's grace and gifts than our than our own efforts. Um, so that is going to look quite different than the philosophical picture, um, and. Uh, for Augustine, there's a universal call to wisdom, but many Christians aren't going to be able to progress that much and are going to have to be reliant on faith. So in, in that way, um, if the the good life, at least in this life, may, maybe does look significantly different, and we'll come back to that. Okay, so now I'm going to present the view of the mind and wisdom that Augustine um, exhorts us towards in um, on the Trinity. Um, and one of the first things he does um, in book 12, where he's he's uh, in trying to understand the Trinity, um, he's first looked at the more um, external parts of our mind and senses, and now he's turning towards the internal mind. And he um, makes a distinction here based on um, the part of our mind or reason that he thinks um, is not the, the senses or memory or imagination that we share with animals, but the part that is um, human reason, um, strictly speaking, but is focused on um, practical and contingent and changing things. Um, things we, we need to distinguish that part from um from our understanding that's aimed at the eternal and unchanging not that these are two completely um different parts he says at the end of this quotation here we're discussing one thing um and we're not doubling it into the two aspects I've mentioned, except in terms of function. Um, but there are two different functions, so the practical function and the contemplative function. And I think here he's, he's um, yeah, clearly picking up on this Aristotelian distinction between practical and con contemplative news, um, reason or, or, or understanding. So that's his picture. And then he's going to argue for the superiority of the contemplative or wisdom seeking um, reason over practical reason. Um, and then discuss some what that pursuit of wisdom looks like. So the way he makes this distinction in terms of what the excellence of practical reason as opposed to the excellence of contemplative reason looks like um, is by describing one as 
um, wisdom, sapientia, um, that covers intellectual cognition of eternal things, and then practical reason. Um, in this work, he calls it um, scientia, um, and it covers rational cognition of temporal things. So any kind of rational cognition that, that has to do with um, the temporal, the changeable, practical, and both uh, wisdom and knowledge are needed, um, but but knowledge is more more limited and uh, not as valuable as um, wisdom. So he says knowledge has its own limited good, um, as long as it's contextualized by this love of eternal things. Um, and we really need knowledge to have the virtues that make for right living. But note for him now, they're making for right living, but they're not making for happy living yet. Instead, you live right now um, with a view to achieving happiness um, later. Um, and he notes that there isn't always, uh, sometimes these terms are uh, sapientia and scientia are, are used interchangeably, are, but, but there is an important sort of philosophical distinction here he wants to point to. Um, and uh, wisdom is going to cover a contemplative understanding of eternal truths. Um, and then scientia or practical wisdom, as he says at the end of the quote is going to cover um, anything that we're doing with the cardinal virtues, anything we're doing with practical wisdom, courageously, moderately, and justly, um, and then all the kinds of knowledge or disciplines that are that are useful for that practical knowledge, um, along with our um, historical knowledge that uh, gives us examples to be pursued and avoided and informs our practical knowledge. That all goes under scientia. Um, as opposed to wisdom, and that's all needed for 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 living well now. So so for Augustine, we need to develop both scientia and sapientia. But scientia can only be be rightly ordered and can only be practical knowledge and useful if it's configured in the light of wisdom. Um, and his overall epistemology or picture of things, um, as as we get in the city of God is that he thinks there are, um, contra the skeptics, some things that we can have certain knowledge about, but he's not convinced that we can have um, an entire confident knowledge of whole disciplines and sciences in the way that, say, an Aristotelian model might might um, suggest it may be more limited, like our 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 self knowledge, our knowledge of certain basic truths of um, logic or mathematics, um, and then we can um, believe the bodily senses and testimony and believe the scriptures, but we don't have full understanding. So now, um, in Augustine's later pick um, epistemology. Um, a number of the intellectual virtues we have don't involve understanding um, and aren't necessarily safe um, in the in the sense that's used in contemporary epistemology, where um, something's safe if you can uh, if it's if it's true that if if some something were to believe um, p p would not be false. Um, for Augustine, that's true of understanding and wisdom in the strict sense, but a lot of the, the practical knowledge that we use in our day-to-day -day life and the testimonial and sensory knowledge, um, we need to use, but we could be wrong about, and we don't have full understanding. So th there's a much bigger role for, for, for belief in Augustine's um, practical life than, than um for some of the Platonists and, and Aristotelians before him. Um, and we can get into that more, but I want to focus now on the ways in which Augustine is um, picking up on um, in uh, these later books of On the Trinity, um, some, 
this idea of an exhortation to wisdom. Um, so one of the key ideas um, in this genre of exhortations to wisdom is um, both arguing for the support superiority of wisdom over practical knowledge and over um, any kind of useful um, activity or instrumental activity. Um, and in this passage of Cicero's, we see him um, referring to ideas of Aristotle that 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 we don't have in this precise formulation. Um, but we see this distinction between um, uh, wisdom and practical knowledge or action that as the horse is born to run, the ox to plow, the dog to follow a scent. So man is born as a sort of mortal god to do two things for understanding and for action. So we've got the contemplative understanding and then some kind of uh, practical action. And both those aspects are, are crucial um, um, for Cicero as, as for Aristotle. And then I think we see Augustine <laughs> picking that up. Um, and we can see some more similarities when we look at um, what are uh, arguably some of the fragments of Aristotle's Protapticus that we do have. Um, so Hutchinson and Johnson have argued that Iamblichus um, actually preserves um, some fairly extensive fragments of Aristotle's Protapticus um, in, uh, in Iamblichus' own Protapticus or Excitation to Philosophy. Um, and so um, I'm just going to note some of the key themes in these um, excerpts that then we'll see Augustine picking up on. Um, so here we get this idea of a human as an animal whose substance is ordered according to reason and intellect. Um, and we get this idea of truth um, as the the work of the intellect or reason and there's going to be both practical and contemplative truth um but then what aristotle argues for is um the superiority of contemplation or observation that um that's what pythagoras um and anaxagoras um these these ancient examples said humans were were here for um, that if we ask why choose to be born and live, um, the, the end of that quotation on the slide, Anaxagoras said, well, to be an observer of the sky and the stars around it, as well as moon and sun. Um, so we've come to be in order to be intelligent um, in this contemplative way, not just to act well practically, but to um, observe and appreciate um, reality. Um, and Aristotle develops this analogy because someone who goes around to all the different festivals and spectacles um, to see and enjoy them um, and would rather do that than uh, get money or other useful things. Um, so too, at the end of this quote, he says, the observation of the universe should be honored above everything that's thought to be useful. For surely one should not travel with great effort for the sake of beholding people imitating girls and slaves or fighting and running and not think one should behold the nature of existing things, that is the truth, for free. So that's really um, our, our function and then the nature of wisdom is to observe and contemplate um, reality on this picture, which I think Cicero and Augustine are then picking up on. Um, and Augustine explicitly um, in uh, the beginning of book 14 on the Trinity um, comes back to this idea of wisdom and philosophy as the pursuit of wisdom. As he's saying, I, I've explicitly said I'm not wise. So what am I doing talking about wisdom? Um, 
And he uh, contextualizes what he's doing in this tradition, which he sees as going back to Pythagoras, um, who didn't want to claim to be wise, but rather to be a philosopher, a lover of wisdom. Um, and then this name found favor among his successors. Um, and Augustine is situating himself in that tradition. I'm not going to dare to profess to be wise, but it's enough for me that it's also the business of the philosopher, that is of the wisdom lover, to discuss wisdom. And, th and that's the thing that even these ancient philosophers would um, agree. And we see Augustine again, he's still using this uh, Ciceronian um, definition of wisdom as knowledge of things human and divine. But now he separates that out and says, well, properly speaking, wisdom um, call it, covers knowledge of divine and eternal things. Um, and then knowledge of human things, that's what he's calling scantia, and that's what's practically focused. Um, and you need both, but the really hard and valuable thing to get um is wisdom um and that's still what augustine presents this work as doing and what he's exhorting his fellow christians to do is to develop in wisdom through trying to understand the trinity through understanding our own minds um and notably augustine uh, abandons the stoic dichotomy between the wise and the foolish. Um, although he uses this dichotomy in some of his um, earlier works, um, that, that either you're wise and happy and foolish, or, or, or you're foolish and unhappy. Um, uh, in his uh, later thought, he says, um, that's actually not the right way to think about wisdom. Um, the Stoics are mistaken. In, a in refusing to admit that someone who's advancing in wisdom has any wisdom at all. Um, and then he refers to this famous Stoic analogy where the foolish are all drowning and it doesn't matter whether you're an inch from the surface or 30 fathoms deep, um, you're all foolish and lack um, wisdom. But Augustine says, actually, uh, a better likeness um, is to compare vice or folly to darkness and virtue or wisdom to light. So the way to wisdom um, is like that of a person um, proceeding from darkness into light on whom more light gradually shines as he advances. So long, therefore, as this is not fully accomplished, we speak of the person as one going from the dark recesses of a vast cavern towards its entrance, who's more and more influenced by the proximity of the light as he comes nearer to the entrance of the cavern, so that whatever light he has proceeds from the light to which he's advancing, and whatever darkness still remains in him proceeds from the darkness out of which he's emerging. So... In switching um, similes, Augustine really switches the picture. And although he's denying um, the possibility of full-fledged wisdom in this life, where, where you, you're sort of in the light um, and out of the cavern, he thinks we're, you're not going to get out of the cavern in this life. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't speak about people who are more or less wise. Um, because you can be closer to the entrance, you can have more light shining on you and less and less darkness. So it becomes something that's progressive and a matter of um, degrees. And that's both motivationally important to think that you, you can achieve um, wisdom and gives a different sense of the excellences where, where they're, 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 it's not something that's all or nothing. Um, But then he does um, pick up on this idea of Cicero's that um, wisdom has an ultimate priority even over um, the best of the cardinal virtues. Um, so he, he's quoting, and, and, and this is our main source for this, this passage from the Hortensius. Um, where Cicero considers what what would you do um, 
in an afterlife where you're spending an immortal age in the Isles of the Blessed. Um, and you won't need courage to face dangers or um, justice to distribute property. Um, well, the answer, Cicero says, is that we would be happy with one single cognition of nature, one knowledge, which is the only thing that even the life of the gods is to be praised for, from which we can gather that other things are a matter of necessity, this one thing a matter to be willed for its own sake. So this is a crucial argument in Cicero um, for the superiority, superiority of wisdom, not only towards productive arts and agriculture and um, the arts of war, but also even towards the cardinal virtues themselves, which in a way are necessary for living well with other human beings, but aren't the ultimate goal. That ultimate goal is a single cognition of nature or one knowledge of reality. Um, and Augustine picks up on that and um, notes um, that Cicero is uh, approving of philosophy um, and the contemplation of nature. Um, and Augustine agrees with that, but then puts his own spin on that, that well, that means primarily knowing and loving the nature which created and established all other natures. Um, but I think Augustine does see that as, as still holding the same view as Cicero's, that the ultimate goal is the contemplation of nature. Um, it's just Augustine puts more emphasis on um, contemplating God as the first and the cause of all other natures. Um and Augustine suggests maybe there's a way in which these virtues um, do continue, um, but it's not going to be in the same way as this life. And he he does affirm the the priority of of wisdom. Um, and then what what does this um, development of wisdom look like? Well, for Augustine. Um, turning towards uh, the eternal as opposed to just practically um, useful thought involves looking into our mind and seeing in our mind the, the image of God um, that is distinctive of humans as opposed to non-rational animals. Um, and what we see here when we look, um, according to Augustine, is that from the beginnings of our of our minds, um, we never stop um, remembering ourselves, understanding ourselves, um, and loving ourselves. So there's a trinity here of um, memory, understanding, and love. Memory and understanding joined um, by love, uh, and that's the image that we can contemplate in knowing ourselves, but that will also help us know the divine in a way that's that's going to be key for um, developing our wisdom. Um, and this inner trinity, our, our self-awareness um, and knowledge, uh, understanding and love of ourselves um, is this image of God um, because it's not just about us, um, but it can also um, be used to be led um, back to God by whom the mind was created with the capacity for God. Um, and this way, the human mind will be wise, not with its own light, but by sharing in that supreme light. So again, we get this idea of we're being enlightened, um, not not by this illumination that's coming from ourselves, but by connecting up to that outer light that then illuminates um, us. And so we achieve human wisdom um, by achieving God's wisdom. That is by getting wisdom from God, not, not as Augustine says at the end of this quotation, the wisdom by which God is wise, but rather the wisdom that God um, puts in human beings. Um, 
and it's this wisdom that also um allows us to to love ourselves and love god because it's in knowing um ourselves and ourselves in relation to god that we're both able to properly love ourselves by placing us our, in the the right order um below god and and on a level with our fellow humans um and then love our neighbor when we see the the common human nature that we share um that I see the image of God in me, but I also see it in all these others, and I see it as all coming from God as the ultimate. So, so this development of um, wisdom and understanding also has a has a practical effect. Um, and again, this is something that we can progress um, in this life, but we're dependent on divine assistance um and we're looking to god's promises to um achieve perfection and achieve this full image and um divine wisdom in which uh human happiness consists as he says at the end of this quote only when it comes to the perfect vision of god will this image bear god's perfect likeness um and then Augustine closes book 14 by coming back to Cicero, coming back to the Hortensius and the pursuit of wisdom, um, where what the goal for the Christian life is, um, is not so much outward external practical actions, those, those are important and there's a place for, for works of charity, but perfecting the image internally um by uh this process of reflection and inner contemplation um that's developing true wisdom or the divine wisdom as opposed to man's wisdom or 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 knowledge or scantia in the sense augustine uses it in on the trinity and that's what um cicero was exhorting us to do um at the end of his dialogue hortentius he says that its goal of sharpening the understanding and grasping reality, Augustine is saying that's still um, the project he's engaged in. Um, as a Christian trying to understand the Trinity, um, he sees that as continuous with what um, Cicero exhorted him to do when he was 17. Um, so in that sense, he really is um, seeing this Christian project of pursuing wisdom and understanding as um, doing precisely what Cicero advised um, us to do in um, sharpening our understanding. Um, but he critiques Cicero in trying to say, well, that could make for a happy life, even if our lives end. Um, he thinks that's wrong and the idea that we could do it ourselves without um divine mediation or help that goes back to the presumption of the philosophers again um that we do have this self-knowledge where all humans see we want to be happy um but when we think that we're mortal and aren't going to be able to um live forever um then uh, there's a temptation to despair or to these kind of stoic um, coping strategies. And that's for Augustine is where this importance of um, faith comes in, something he emphasizes in book 13, um, that you need faith in order to be um, confident about immortality and the possibility of um, a good life where you have wisdom and goods of body, soul, and um, relationships. Um, and for Augustine, both of the key intellectual virtues we need, knowledge and wisdom, are going to be received through the mediator. Um, that he thinks the philosophers were right to pursue wisdom and they got some things right in their philosophizing, but they were missing out on this crucial aid. Um, and that's why he thinks some of them looked for different intermediaries, turned to to, to demons when they weren't connected um, to Jesus. And the advantage of 
the Christian path is that you both get a guide to the practical and temporal life through the the life of Jesus and his example. Um, you get uh, faith and information about temporal things and how to live, but also truths about eternal things. Um, Jesus is is both the incarnate image of what a good human life looks like and the eternal word um, that has full understanding of reality of the sort that we're trying to grasp. And so through Jesus, we go straight towards him. Augustine says at the end of the question, through knowledge toward wisdom without ever turning aside from one and the same Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So I th think you can see now how Augustine is clearly continuing to advocate for the superiority of contemplative wisdom over practical choice, um, but insisting on their unity and specifically their, their unity in, in, in the mediator. Um, and that we become ourselves by turning towards God, by turning towards this divine life. Um, in a way that's similar to what Cicero and Aristotle advocated, um, and where we learn about the divine by contemplating our, our own minds, and the ultimate goal of human life is wisdom. Um, but it does look um, significantly different as well in this Christian context, where it's through the mediator Jesus Christ that knowledge and wisdom are achieved. Um, this progress towards wisdom is, is limited but real. Um, but also uh, Augustine is content with some Christians um, believing in faith without necessarily getting that far in this life um, in developing wisdom. And that that might be an important difference, as well as this idea that progress, progress and perfection are dependent on God's grace and God's gifts. Um, so I think there really is an important continuity that Augustine even in this late work, sees what he's doing as what the Hortensius told him to do, to pursue wisdom. Um, but the way in which he's doing that um, has significantly changed. Um, and we can discuss whether whether that really, uh, the, the method um, has changed so much that it no longer falls under philosophy's way of life. But I'll leave things there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kyla. Thank you also for respecting the time we have long time for discussion, which is also always a good thing. Uh, I will invite normal people to raise their hands if they want to speak. Elder. Thank you very much, uh, Caleb, for this very exciting, very illuminating and very clear presentation. Uh, I, and I apologize in advance, but I have to leave a little bit early, so uh, I'm not, uh, I'll not be here till the end, but uh, I would uh, really love to hear more. And uh, my question uh, concerns the status of philosophy in this framework. So I found it very convincing all the analogies you established and um, this was very helpful for me. Um, but um, I wonder if uh, from Augustine's point of view, especially in his later works, uh, if he ever uh, suggests, or if we could infer from what he says, that there is some need for philosophy, some specific need for philosophy, something that philosophy gives that is not only uh, that cannot be simply given by faith. So th there are certain passages, uh, or many passages, as far as I remember, that establish happiness as, or the ultimate happiness as the contemplation of God. So one could perhaps argue that uh, one needs this kind of wisdom or this kind of specific wisdom given by philosophy and rational undertaking to fully to have full access to that contemplation. So one would be able to reach truth by faith, but not one would not reach it perfectly or one would reach it better using philosophy or a certain sort of philosophy. Could we argue something along these lines? Or can we reach... Uh, wisdom in a very broad sense as contemplation of God uh, through non-philosophical means for Augustine. So how do you uh, see this question? Yeah, so I think the way I read him, um, final wisdom, I, I see him as really saying the kind of 
ultimate Christian wisdom will meet the definitions of wisdom given by people like like the Stoics or or Aristotle, where it will involve understanding and comprehension. Um, so in that sense, there isn't a disagreement um, about the ultimate goal. It's just um, about how we get there and when we get there. Um, now, there I think there is a sense of philosophy that Augustine does sometimes, or well, actually, I, th I think he pretty much always uses it when he's talking about the philosophers. He he doesn't um, he doesn't usually attack you know the the abstract noun, um, but it is more the philosophers when it's seen as a pursuit of truth or understanding um, purely through human means. He's suspicious, but I think there is a specifically philosophical role um, in the development of intellectual virtues for for even for the later Augustine both in that um, through developing our, our mind, through trying to understand ourselves, through understanding things like mathematics, we, we get kind of models of what understanding and comprehension look like that will be helpful as we're sort of moving towards the light. And you wouldn't get that if you, if you haven't had this, this training. Um, so, so, so I think that even though he doesn't think um, we can sort of master all the Aristotelian sciences, um, he he thinks there is that kind of training that's important. And I think he thinks philosophical reasoning is very important for addressing the skeptics, which he he does take to be a continuing problem. And, and that that's something where it's not going to be appropriate to just point to scripture, but you are going to have to get into these um philosophical arguments that the skeptics put forward and then use reason to to deflate and respond to them. So those are sort of the two particular sort of philosophical roles I, I see in the, the later Augustine. Thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Luis had raised his hand. Did you give up or do you still want to speak, Luis? Uh, no, let's, uh, I, I'm trying to decide if I have a question or not, because I'm not really a specialist in Augustine and I prefer to listen to other people who are more knowledgeable than I am. Okay, but I, I'll we'll... raise my hand if I feel the need to later. Okay. Thank then you. Then I will give the word to Pedro Dotto. Thank you very much. And thank you, first of all, Caleb, for the wonderful, uh, very insightful uh, presentation. And my question is kind of related to Elder's question. So on the uh, debate, the classical position between faith and reason, so fides and ratio, uh, would you say that in the late Augustine that you represented to us, uh, that in his appropriation and even adaptation of the classical tradition of philosophy as a way of life and rethinking Christianity as a way of life, would you say that he gives priority, ultimately priority, to faith or to reason in the uh, fulfillment and the flourishing of the Christian way of life. I know that you could argue that there is a combination of both reason mm -hmm. and reasonlessness, but like what receives priority ultimately, faith or reason? I'm thinking also of, you know, like F Pascal and uh, different thinkers mm -hmm. who have uh, struggled around this question. And then just another question that I would like for you to elaborate on, like what is the role of grace specifically uh, in these... Um, project that Augustine is presenting of thinking about Christianity and uh, justifying rationalizing Christianity as a peculiar way of life. Uh, so the role of grace that you talk, touched on in your presentation, but I would like to hear more on it. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so what I would say on the priority question is, um, Augustine's perspective there is going to be um, a little like uh, peripatetic views on the priority of um, practical and theoretical reason that um, uh, faith and and the uh, practical virtues that it it enables and develops are are more practically necessary and useful that like the first thing you need to do is try to live rightly. Um, and you really need, uh, yeah, 
to the uh, faith and and these virtues to do that. So that's sort of more necessary. But in terms of the ultimate goal, um, well, faith will be replaced by sight and these virtues will be either replaced or transformed. So so the ultimate goal and fulfillment is is um, wisdom and this contemplative thing. But for many people, you might not be able to make as much progress towards there. And, and you, you, you've you got to start with what's um, necessary and most useful. And then to the extent that you're able and have the opportunity, try to develop towards wisdom. So so, th so that's how I address that part. Um, as far as grace, um, I think there are two functions. One is to just push back on the presumption of the philosophers that um, the, that virtue, knowledge, and wisdom can be achieved through our own efforts. Um, and that's something that the, these early dialogues of Augustine at Kasigiakum at least seem to suggest might might be possible and then he he firmly turns away and and that's the part of the the classical inheritance this idea that happiness and the good life have to be up to us that i think you can really say that augustine gives up on and and depending on how crucial you think that that is um that that might inform how much you think his project is is something different um then what I want to think through more is um, the role of grace in intellectual life itself. And there, partly Augustine has this theory of illumination and knowing through illumination, though that's more pronounced in some of his earlier works than, than the later. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how important that ends up being in the, his later conception of the intellectual virtue. So th that's sort of something I've flagged. I'm thinking about, about uh, more, but I, but I don't have um, a final answer on. Would I just ask one question of clarification regarding the first one, the first question? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was very helpful. Just to understand you uh, correctly, for you, faith is only necessary for practical reason and practical virtue in this world, but doesn't have a role to play in theoretical virtue and in contemplation. Uh, right, it? not not directly. It might have an indirect role in that um, faith and trust in God might enable you to start on the path of understanding, but but it's not it's not going to play and it intrinsic role in the development of wisdom and understanding itself other than sort of preparing the way at least at least that's how i how i read what he's doing okay thank you at the moment i don't see any other hand raised if you want to if any of you want to intervene in the discussion please raise your hand either virtually or ah leonard leonard please Can I be heard? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I was a, a little uh, unsatisfied with the answer to Helder's question. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe there's more that Augustine offers here, but I don't think we heard a, a, a sufficient to really get Helder's question addressed. Look, we know what it is to reason about things. We make arguments, we make distinctions, we draw conclusions, et cetera. Uh, and when we are going to uh, contemplate, just contemplate God, uh, what, what do we do? Uh, what, what is it exactly that we do that then leads to wisdom? Now, you know, rabbinical Judaism has a kind of answer. Well, we take the scriptures and we endlessly discuss them. So it's a kind of reason embedded in a religious practice. What does, uh, what does Augustine give us? Yeah, good. So I'd say part of, Part of his answer to that question will, yeah, will be a version of that, that, that um, 
the Christian life is going to be a lot of meditating on and discussing scriptures. But then I think there's a particular thing that he's doing in On the Trinity, where you're leading up towards the contemplation of God by contemplating our own minds, um, where uh, this isn't just um, an Aristotelian sense of contemplation where you've sort of figured out the premises and put it all together. Um, it is more platonic in that it's still exploring and going back and forth between working up to principles and working down. Um, and it is, um, I would say not, well, there are definitely arguments involved, but, but it's primarily this kind of inner reflective activity where I'm, um, you know, trying to do some understanding or reasoning, and then I'm reflecting on that understanding and reasoning in a way that's building up and deepening my model and understanding of myself. Uh, and in doing that, that's also supposed to be building up and deepening my knowledge and understanding um, of God, the, the being being in whose image I I I made. So so I think that's the specific. Um, spiritual exercise that, that's a, that's different than sort of just philosophical arguments, but I think is continuing some of these practices that are already there in people like Plotinus um, in middle and late Platonists, where we have this idea of seeking wisdom through turning within and reflecting on what's within, where that isn't as argumentative, but, it, but it's definitely still a uh, a use of reason, and I would would argue philosophical. Are you satisfied, Leonard? Well, uh, you know, not not entirely. I, I mean, I understand the kind of, uh, you know, the uh, you know the way it now it sounds like a kind of investigation. So it sounds very reasoned. Yeah, well, a meditate. I mean, a meditation. Uh, so there's an investigative, but it's also very experiential, and it's focused because because that's the thing Augustine's ends up being most um, certain and confident about is our is our own own self knowledge and inner experience. Um, that that's going to be even more certain than you know any argument I can construct, and so that's what I have to keep coming back to in my meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. some, you know, arguments about models of the mind, but also just this experience of reflecting on um, the mind as something the mind is doing. And I'm revealing who I am and who my, what my mind is in the experiencing, in the doing of the meditating. Okay, thank you. Right, we have this, another... It's some, 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 somewhat okay. One more, one more try. Look, suppose we're struggling with a mathematical problem. There's, we may say there's two things going on. One is the struggle, where we write things down, we cross things out, we try out different things, we reason backwards to that. And then there is the experiential moment where we see that the solution works. That's nothing that we do. That's the, a kind of ineffable result of what we do. So it's just, it, I mean, it's, 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 it still sounds like what we do is, no matter how you couch it, still sounds like a good reason. Yeah, maybe. But happens. I, well, you know, but I think what, what's, what's different with the mathematical example is there the thinking that I'm doing mathematically is a little different than thinking about myself, even thinking about myself as thinking mathematically, that uh, the success or failure of my understanding of a, of a proof, um, that's about doing the mathematics. But when I reflect on my, you know, ability to do math and what that's like and what that says about the mind, there's some overlap, but there's some discontinuity there in those two activities. Whereas I, where I think what's so important for Augustine, why he's so focused on self-knowledge, is there there's a sameness between um, what I'm in, investigating and what I'm trying to figure out, and then this reflective part of it, where um, in reflecting on what I'm doing and thinking about the mind, I am thinking about the mind, 
and uh, illuminating what the mind is. So, so there, um, well, I'm not sure I want to say it's a second order activity, but if it is a second order activity or whatever that reflexive or turning back activity on is also yeah. the same as what I'm trying to grasp in the first order activity. Whereas in the mathematical case, there's two different things. There's the understanding the mathematics, and then there's like, what are humans' minds like such that we can understand mathematics? And those are at least more distinct than in the self-knowledge case that he's he's really focused on. Okay, another question by Carissa. Hey, Lib. Good to see hey. you. Um, I have a question about um, this potentially an, an unfair question, uh, but it's it, it's about something you said at the very end, where uh, you were saying that um, for for Augustine, we become more ourselves by living a divine life instead of a merely human one, and this makes me think about the end of the Nicomachean. Machian ethics, where Aristotle is talking about, you know, how we live in accordance, the best sort of life for a human being. And, you know, one of the things that Aristotle says there, right, of course, is that there's this divine element in us that living in accordance with that is, you know, the best sort of life, but we can't just live in accordance with that, right, because of our humanness. And so I'm wondering how different or similar you think Augustine's sort of account of this is, or am, am, is he picking up on, are you, by talking about living a divine life instead of a merely human one, are you talking about something else that's not the sort of thing that it, that Aristotle is getting at at the end of Nicomachean Ethics? Yeah, no, I, I think it is quite similar, especially because Augustine does, in one of the passages I cited, make this distinction that he's saying, well, I don't mean um, that we literally have God's wisdom because that, that would be being God and we can't do that. But the goal isn't human wisdom. The goal is divine wisdom in the sense of like understanding of God and reality insofar as humans are, are capable of it. So, so, so I see that as similar in saying, well, the goal shouldn't be something merely human. It should be something divine, but like something divine that's a little more, more limited than what the divine itself is. Um, and then the, the other, this famous passage from the Theotetus that the, 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 the goal for humans is to become like the divine it, as much as that's possible. And so far as that's possible, um, that I think that's informing Augustine and certainly all the Platonists like Plotinus he's, he's, he's reading. Um, and I think, as I said before, there, he has his own version of for, for Aristotle, um, you know, you should sort of maximize contemplation to the extent that that's humanly possible, but it depends on your place within the city and um, various other necessities. Um, and I think something similar like that is true for Augustine and wisdom, but, the, but there are big caveats there in that, you know, on, on Aristotle's picture, there are at least a few elites who really can achieve wisdom and the rest of society should be set up to enable that. Um, Augustine, I think in a way is less elitist in that he thinks that no one is of that elite because because no one's going to get that full vision of God in, in, in this life. Um, and sort of everyone has a responsibility and an ability to make progress towards it. Um, but uh, where it's maybe different from Aristotle or, or where I wonder whether it does look different, the fact that no one can get all the way there... Um, might make you wonder whether it's sort of all right for more people to postpone moving further in in wisdom. But I think partly Augustine thinks since that's the end goal and why you're trying to get to anyway, it should be pretty motivating to at least pursue that as much as you can. Um, but I but I think they, they, they both have a significant role for the necessities of life. Um, but how that plays out um, is a little bit different based on their differing understandings of who can achieve the good and to what extent. Another question by Ramit. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wonder um, how specific Augustine is about the roles or functions of the rational faculties in the afterlife. And I mean both the state of the soul after bodily death and before resurrection and the final state after resurrection. 
Can you say anything about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it is important, this background view that um, he wants to say we're talking about two aspects of reason, but not two really, really sort of ontologically separate um, abilities. So um, in that sense, he's happy to say, well, there might be some circumstances under which you just don't need practical reason or don't need it in the same way. Um, but I think what he struggles with and doesn't definitively answer is um, he's committed to the importance of the bodily resurrection as key to our happiness um, and to the human good life. Um, but then he's still not confident about, well, what does that look like in terms of activities? How important is it uh, for the resurrected um, happiness that they that they are, you know, literally using their eyes and their ears and their hands to um, see and touch and hear um, aspects of of the new world? So I think think. In that sense, he's still trying to figure out what the role of the senses and sensation um, looks like there. And and the way at least I read him, it is more a investigation or question, and he's not satisfied with an answer. And I think something a little like that is true for, for practical reason, is that to some extent, he's tempted by the idea that maybe there's just going to be contemplation there, because you won't have to sort of achieve things practically. But then the fact that there's still a role for the body and the senses um, maybe suggests and uh, that there's something like that for practical reason. And that's why in most of these passages, he does try to suggest a way in which the cardinal virtues could still be present, but in a transformed way, where it's sort of love firmly holding on to God is like the version of courage. So there aren't any dangers, but there's still something courage-like um, there. But for, for me, I think that's that's a puzzle, and he doesn't know quite what to say about the sense in which their um, practical reason and the cardinal virtues are preserved or used Um either in the interim state or or um, post bodily resurrection. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks so much. Maybe I can also make a question. I, I my original question was very much related uh, with Elder's question and Pedro's question uh, because by listening to you, my impression uh, was that Augustine really um, moves from a philosophical way of life to a religious uh, way of life. And I was wondering if the, in, in, in the later stage we can identify something specifically philosophical in this way of life or a specific role um, uh, ascribed to reason in this way of life, or even because he didn't speak that much about that, if we can find any spiritual exercise that can be considered considered strictly philosophical or in any spiritual exercise that uh, besides uh, contemplating God. But since you have already touched these points, maybe I can make my question a bit uh, broader. Since you uh, have uh, made so much research on Augustine, which is this very difficult case in this, uh, who is this difficult case in this regard, do you have an easy question, an easy an answer for the question of the distinction between the religious and the philosophical way of life? Would you have a, a, a clear way to this, how to distinguish them and can that, can them be easily distinguished, distinguishable or what is your position regarding that? Yeah. So, I mean, I've worked out um, to some extent a position on this in, in the, these two articles I co-authored with, with Stephen Grimm, um, where basically we argue, instead of defining the philosophical life in terms of the use of reason or argument, um, we define it as um, truth-seeking. Um, in a way that actually fits very well with those uh, fragments from the Protepticus, um that that I had up there. Um, and I think that's a significant difference because it leaves open a greater variety of of practice practices. Um, and the specific one, I guess um, I'm uh, talking about in the connection of on the trinity is this kind of inner meditation on um 
on reason and the the human mind that um i mean you could put and the, there are passages that you could put in terms of argument but but it, but it is more like a quest for something like an intellectual vision or seeing of oneself um and I think you can make the case that that's that that's truth seeking, that that's a method or exercise that's supposed to get us to the truth about ourselves, um, even if it doesn't use reason and argumentation in an entirely standard um, philosophical way. Um, and so this definition kind of leaves open a greater variety of practices that uh, as long as you can make the case that they're opening you up to the truth, I mean, it could be contemplating a painting or 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 reading a novel um though we do also say there's got to be some role for reason we, we say that it should be truth seeking and reasons responsive so so if there are sort of objections or or, or questions about the practice that you're doing about whether it, it succeeds um you should be attentive and responsive to those and not and not, not just say well you know i think i'm getting the truth through this way that it's fine. And I think that is something that Augustine would meet the condition for, that he's, you know, doing this kind of intermittent meditation on um, what am I as a rational being and what can that tell me about God through the image of God. Um, but he's aware of these skeptical worries. He, he, he addresses them. Um, He's, you know, considering objections to the kind of model of mind that he puts forward. And, you know, often he's unsatisfied with his model of mind and will will note failings. So um, in that sense, I want to present um, this kind of internal investigation of the human mind as an example of, of something that I think is philosophical in the sense that it's truth seeking and responsive to reasons. Um, even if it doesn't look entirely like a traditional philosophical argument. Okay, thank you so much. If there are no further questions, I will now close this session. The next one will be on December 13 with Jordi Crespo, but I will send you the usual reminders. Thank you all for, for being there and for the great discussion. And especially, of course, thanks to Professor Kailev Koho for the great talk. Uh, see you next time. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Great questions. Bye. -bye. Bye.